Romans chapter 3, and we'll begin reading in verse 19, and probably just read to the end of the chapter. Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now... The righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time His righteousness, that He might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. I'll conclude our reading this morning, and as a result of those scripture readings and the content found therein, um, the title of our message today is going to be, I am a good person. I am a good person. Now, two thoughts as as we were reading this scripture come to my mind um, initially, I suppose. One is, um, I think that one of the, and I won't get off on this tangent this morning, but I think one of the reasons why that people busy their minds as much as they do is because in stillness and in quiet, we're confronted with some very big questions about ourselves and about the world. And if our mind is never still, and we can occupy our mind continuously, then it's more, um, it's easier to avoid those questions and thoughts because the potential answer to those questions are quite terrifying to think about. And so this morning, if you're someone who has not thought about very much the deeper questions of life, I want you, I want to confront them or confront you with them this morning. When I think about what's called existential questions, all that means is questions about our existence. There are four big ones that come to my mind that people tend to gravitate towards. And they're all connected. Where did all this come from? What? Creation, origin is a question. What am I doing here? Questions of purpose. That question in particular confronts you usually middle to late age. When you thought you knew the reason, and so you sought to employ yourself doing all these activities, and then you fulfilled all of those things, and you think, well, that didn't give me the high I expected, or the fulfillment that I expected is not there. 
And so a lot of people in the middle age begin to wonder, what am I doing here anyway? And then connected to that is questions about morality. What is right and wrong to do? What is okay? Not based on the eyes of my parents or based on my own intuitions, but what is objectively right? And then finally, where do we go after this? See, all these questions are are definitely connected. And they're ones that I believe are byproduct of what is written, the longing of the heart. Or in other words, they don't ever go away. We can suffocate them and we can avoid them, but left unanswered, there is a need in the human heart to know. And as we have heard requests this morning in preparation for death, certainly it becomes all the more necessary to figure out what am I doing here and where am I going after this is all over? And the Bible, more than any other book, and Christianity, more than any other worldview, gives a very detailed answer to each one of those questions. Here in this scripture, it confronts all of mankind with what can be a immediate gut reaction to some of those questions. So we might say, and I think many people, most religions have some sort of conception of an afterlife after this, some place of paradise and peace and comfort And on the other side, most religions have some sort of punishment that could lie after this life. And so the Bible confronts head on in this scripture, as it has stated throughout the word of God, through many various books inspired by God, and when Jesus himself answers these questions, listen, there is a heaven and there is a hell. And the immediate response that the human heart justifies in ourselves is, well, I have to be going to heaven. And I think the gut reaction through all of human history has been, the reason is because down deep, I'm a good person. This verse addresses that question and that assumption. My wife was one of those who grew up with that thought. That the basic tenor of what she was told was, if you live a good life and you have good intentions and you avoid evil as much as you are able, then certainly when you get to heaven... God will let you in because all the good people go to heaven. But I want you to know that not only is that idea nowhere in the Bible, the Bible clearly refutes even the smallest assumption that that could ever be true. Over and over, especially in this book that we're reading this morning, This apostle, under God's inspiration, tells us nobody, because of their goodness, goes to heaven. Period. End of story. And so if believing in Jesus, because Christianity says so in some shallow way, is what you've planned... But in case that doesn't work, my backup plan is that I'm going to live good all along the way so that when I get to God, God will see my good intent and let me in. Let me go ahead and spoil it before you get there. He will not allow you entrance there. This scripture told us with no, with with absolute clarity By the deeds of the law, 
All that means is by the performance of good works, no flesh is justified in God's sight. Why does he tell us that? Well, before this scripture that we read, and I found this very fascinating, this is probably what prompted this message this morning, is we have this thought in our mind that we're really not that bad. That's what most people think. And it's amazing, even good Christian people, how we can lessen in our minds, the evil that is in our hearts. And yet, that is an evidence of our wickedness, is the ability and the propensity to think that we're not that bad. You see what I'm saying? An evidence that you're even more wicked than you thought is that you think, I'm really not that wicked. Right? That's how it's called in the term, a term that was left from the Reformation was that exact thing, that our depravity bends upon itself. Or in other words, we're so evil that we think we're not evil. And that's just a sign of how bad that we really are. Here before this, the Apostle Paul, to prove this, he goes through the Old Testament and he begins to Quote all of these verses. I'm not going to read them to you, but if you were to read verses 10 through verses 18, that nine verses prior to our reading, you would see that all he does is take these scriptures from the Old Testament that show our minds, our hearts, our intentions, our words, and our actions, all of them from beginning to end are rooted in our own corruption and sin. He establishes that you're bad. You're not a good person. See, good's a relative term. Good compared to what? Good compared to your siblings? Good compared to your coworkers? Well, those are not the standard that God lays out for all people. God is not looking for you to be better than someone else. Down on this world, it's like, it's like the pot calling the kettle black, right? That compared to you, I'm less black, I'm less dark, I'm less this or that. But listen, what the Bible has concluded is that all mankind is fallen under sin. And what God is looking for is not people who are less bad, but people who reach the standard of his son, Jesus. You know what that standard is? Perfect. Good people don't go to heaven. Perfect people do. Guess what? Nobody's perfect. And so I think there are a whole lot of people who die and are genuinely surprised to open their eyes in torment because they thought it was by the deeds of the law that they would be justified. But listen, I have a better way to show you this morning. You see, if we were justified by the works of the law, can you imagine how burdensome that would be? Can you imagine what a slave that you would feel like if you knew every word, every thought, every deed, every intent had to be perfect or had to be good? And if it wasn't, that God would then in some way, look at these things and come up with some formula and and try to determine, aren't you thankful this morning if you know the Lord that your salvation has nothing to do with your own performance before God? If our performance was to lead to salvation, it would be a life of uncertainty and fear because in truth, 
I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I don't know the sins that will tempt me and that I will fall to next week or the next month or the next year. I'm afraid at times when I think about the future, not of what other people will do, but what my fallen heart will conceive and execute. And at times of repentance before God, when I am praying, sometimes I'm saying, Lord, I want you to forgive me now, but please, I know that these same situations will arise in the near future. And I know the tendency of my heart to fall in those circumstances to sin. Please, in those moments, protect me from committing those same things that I so loathe in this moment. Because my heart, I know my nature. I know the sin of my heart. And I know that if God grants me a future, I'll be just as susceptible to sin then as I am now. Here, if you look at verses 19 and verse 20 and what we read, it says that the law speaks to those who are under the law. We're all under the law or responsible for keeping the law, for doing good. To think of it in its most simple standpoint. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. You see, here's what has happened. We were talking about those questions at the very beginning. And so what people have naturally done is link two of those four questions together. And they've said this, okay, I'm going to define morality, what is right and wrong. And then I'm going to use that as the standard to determine what happens to me after this. Right, And so they've connected two of these very deep questions. And it's been done so much and so often that religions has tied that together as the core of their religious doctrine. That you must do good in order to get to heaven. And there are denominations of Christianity and Islam in its entirety is predicated on that notion. And Judaism and the distortion that it was in the Old Testament and at points in the New, that was the mentality that people had do good and rewards come after this life but what Paul is revealing here is that the law was given not to justify people and get you into heaven but rather the intent of it was to show you that by your good works there is no way you're getting there you see what mankind has done to the law the intent God gave it was to By the law is the knowledge of sin. Not by the law comes salvation from sin. By the law comes the understanding that I am a terrible sinner. Today, in our world, people are very soft. They don't like to go to places listen to people, or sit under preaching where sin is directly called out. And when it is, very often the defense mechanism is to then point out two things. One, I'm better than the people around me. And secondly, who are you to judge me? And those two shields are what people use to defend them against what God's intent for the law was. Listen to me this morning. If you have never been saved by God's grace, first you must know that you stand guilty of sin before a holy God. That is not because I think I'm better than you that I'm telling you that. Rather, it's the complete opposite of that. I too am guilty of sin. And this message of law and judgment had to come to my heart and reveal the sin. And so when in the Bible it says, do not lust, and you find yourself full of lust. When the Bible says, do not covet, and all you spend your time doing is looking at things online that other people have that you want, jealous of what they have. When you devise hatreds, when you gossip maliciously about people, 
when you instantly judge people much more harshly than what you, the standards you hold yourself to. And God has pronounced clearly in his word, those things that you're doing are sinful. God is not trying to provoke you necessarily to just do those a little less in hopes that less doing less sin will permit you into heaven. What God gave those laws for was to show you, look at the wickedness of your heart. You're wicked, and you stand condemned before a holy God, not in the future, right now. You're under a sentence of condemnation. What does that mean? That means God has announced to the world that anybody who has sinned is deserving of eternal judgment. Thus, you're left to Reason very simply, simple enough for anybody to understand. Ask yourself the question, have I sinned? The Bible tells us in the book of James chapter 2. It says if a man has broken the law in one point, he is guilty of all. You see, that's not fair. I don't know. Think about it like this. If you bought a brand new, very expensive vehicle, and there was just one integral part in the engine that was broken, would you be satisfied? No, what would you do? You would say, this is defective. And what if the guy came back and said, well, it's just one part. Say, I don't care. My expectation, whenever I bought this, was for a perfect vehicle. Every part, just as you said. If there was just one ding or one scratch in a brand new expensive car, you would take it back and you would tell everybody about the malign standard of that particular a man who sold it to you. And you would tell everybody, do not go there. Well, guess what? God has standards too. And his standard is that you, you're not defective in any part. And if you're defective in any part, it affects the value of the whole. It says the law was given so that every mouth may be stopped. Do you know why God has given a law to find you guilty? It's so that you can stop boasting about how good of a person you are. Because nobody's good. I don't care if you've turned over a new leaf. I don't care if you, from the time you were a child, were faithful to attend church and have all these religious credentials that you can throw in front of people. None of that matters before God. God gave laws. He gave his word to reveal to the world, you are guilty. Now stop bragging about your own righteousness and thinking that will get you into heaven because it won't. He continues, and he says this. Now, I'm not going to get to all this, these verses of Scripture. But he says this in verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So here's basically what he's saying here. If if we've established you're not going to get there by good works, well, then how do you become righteous before the eyes of a holy God? See, words like righteousness are big $10 words that are in the Bible that people think they have some obscure, not understandable meaning. And I want to be as simple as I can this morning. Being righteous is being right before God. Having done things right Before God. Having satisfied God and his requirements. So if we see that God has a certain standard. 
And by the works of the law, I am not righteous enough to submit my life to him as a a means of obtaining eternal salvation. That I can't say, God, look at all of my deeds. Thus, give me entrance into paradise because I am unrighteous. My life is not right. Then the question is then, how do I get to a right standing with God to where he receives me into his kingdom? And he says this, well, righteousness was revealed without the law. So here's what I want to tell you this morning. If you're ever going to get to heaven, it's not going to have to do with you keeping the law. You're not going to get to heaven by being a good person. Nobody has ever gotten to heaven because they were good. That includes the Virgin Mary. That includes the Apostle Paul. That includes every anointed or or, or every person that the world anoints as what they call a saint. Well, I want to tell you something too. I'm a saint as well. And so are these people sitting here who have been saved by God's grace because what makes a person a saint, despite what some religions may say, is not because you lived a good life. It's not because you performed some group of miracles that have been validated by other people, God alone justifies people and makes them right with him. And at the moment he does that, they become a saint of God. Here, the righteousness of God has been revealed to the world without the law. Jesus Christ. Why, why, does, why does church so much about Jesus? Why do churches always talk about Jesus? Because it is that man alone that grants us entrance into paradise. He is the door. And no man can come in any other way but by Jesus Christ. His righteousness. The Bible says this in verse 21. Has been testified about by the law and the prophets. So you know a, another purpose of the law, one of them is to point out our sins. But you know the flip side to the purpose of the law and pointing out our sins is to do something equally important, to show the righteousness of Jesus. So in on one hand, we have this law that says, do not lust, do not covet, do not have pride in your heart, do not do all of these things. And so we see that law and we inspect ourselves and we realize that from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet, I am full of sin. And I come up with all of these creative ways to conceive sin. And then I have this terrible tendency to lie, my, lie to myself to cover up all of my sin. And so when I take the law and I evaluate myself, I feel hopeless because all I see is sin. And yet there's a silver lining in that because then I also look at the law and I see Jesus. And Jesus by the law is pronounced to be perfect in every way. All the Old Testament is full of these saints, these good people, Moses and David and Abraham. And each one of them have a root of sin that ran just as deep as you and I. And they battled the flesh every moment of every day just like you and I. And in no way were they above us in their proclivity to sin. Oh, but Jesus was born of the seed of a woman. Why is that important? Well, because the seed of sin, or we're talking about genetics now, right? I got my eye color from my mother. I got my hair color from my father. We take those things and we, we look and we say, well, this came from this and this came from this. Well, let me tell you that your sinfulness was passed down through the seed of your father. You say, well, then how do women have sin? Well, because every woman has a father, right? Every woman's sinful because she inherited that trait from her father. Well, guess what? Jesus had no earthly father. The Bible tells us in the book of Luke a very pivotal, necessary thing that was prophesied about in Isaiah chapter 7, that behold, a virgin would conceive. What? 
That's an oxymoron. How does that happen? How does a virgin conceive or bring forth a son? And they shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, the book of Luke tells us how that happened. The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and fertilized that egg, and thus Jesus was born. Not infected with the seed of sin. So when Jesus was born, listen to me, he was a true perfect baby. We walk around and see babies are born and we say, oh, he's so perfect. No, he's not. She's perfect. No, she's not. And you just wait until you're up for the fourth or fifth night in a row in the middle of the night and you'll realize, no, they're anything but perfect. And as they grow, the imperfections of their nature only magnify. And we begin to realize that at the youngest of ages, they lie and they steal and they're violent and they have pride. All of those things cover even newborn children. And listen, Jesus was different because when he was born of a virgin and the law was strictly peering over them, he was responsible for keeping the law. And for over 33 years, Jesus, day in and day out in a sinful world, interacting with sinful, awful people people, Jesus remained spotless and sinless. Isn't that amazing to you? If it's not, let me challenge you to this. Go one hour without sinning. Like, try it. Document it. See if you can go one hour and control that thing but between your ears without thinking of something sinful. I'll say ten minutes. How about that? How about five minutes? Five minutes. See if you can go five minutes. Like, really try it. Because anybody who thinks that they can conquer sin has never tried to live sinless. Now, can you imagine Jesus? And so here's what it says. The law and the prophets showed what righteousness looked like. How do they do that? Through the body and life of Jesus. So the law... All the while it's condemning me and you is revealing, look at how right he is. Think of it like this. Think of it like a man who I said, that man is really strong. And you said, prove it. What? So I said, okay, Brother Brian, you go attack that man. See if you can bring him down. And Brother Brian does, and the man conquers him. And I said, Brother Danny, you go next. And I said, okay, now both of you go at the same time. And he fends both of them off. And I continue to want to try to prove the strength of the man. And so one by one, I begin to up the ante. I begin to go to younger men and stronger men and those that have a more of a, a skill to wrestle. And one by one by one, we send at the man and he conquers them all. And so finally, I say it's a free for all. Everybody go at him and try to bring him down. And if when it's all said and done, all of them are defeated on the ground and he is the champion of them all, that personifies is what Jesus did to the law. Right? All of these laws that you and I are responsible for keeping all attacked Jesus. He was responsible to keep them all, both in letter and in spirit. And as every one of them rolled at him, he conquered every one of them. And as his life went on, the situations in order to do so got more and more and more difficult from a human vantage point, right? Because then people would lie in wait and they would craft together these, these conniving and these, 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 this, this conception of how can we catch him? How can we plot? How can we make things difficult? And so in the same analogy, if I gave us weeks to prepare to bring this man down, months to prepare to bring this man down, and we plotted and we practiced and we executed over and over and, and all of our practices, it had been successful. And then we plotted against this man, Jesus. He didn't have to prepare. He didn't have to strain. But he kept every law to the jot and tittle perfectly. I'm almost done. I want to say this last thing. In the very next chapter... There's so much in this third chapter I wish I could have gotten to. 
so much time to explain, but I just can't. He brings out the way in which we are justified then before God. And that is this. It's not by trying to do the same things Jesus did in conquering the law. But it's by trusting that what he did was sufficient to provide me eternal life. Or in other words, this. One day, see, the law has attacked you, and you've lost. And the Bible tells us now, as a result of you losing to sin, you're a slave to sin. It controls you. It has shackled you. Every person, it is shackled. It controls. And there is nothing you can do to get out of it, of your own strength. But then there's this man, Jesus, and he beckons to the world and he says, come to me and I will unlock these chains of sin which control you. I'll grant you security in this afterlife because there is coming a day where you are going to face the the ultimate consequence of your sin, which is death. But listen, he was another one that attacked me along with all of the law. Death also attacked Jesus. And guess what? The last enemy that Jesus defeated was also death. And now Jesus controls Controls or has the power over death. And so what do I have to do to be a beneficiary of that conquering? Well, I've got to trust that he really did what he said he did and can grant me that same privilege. See, it's a game of, not a game, it's a, it's a life of Trust. That's really difficult to do. Here's the reason, here's part of the reason why. Depending on how suspicious of a person you are, if I if I told you, pick one person, give them full access to everything in your life. Some of you would probably look at your spouse with suspicious eyes, right? That's how fearful you are of being taken advantage of. And so here this preacher gets up and he says this. You've got to trust your future eternal destiny to a man named Jesus. And you've never met him before. People say, I don't know about all that. And it continues and it says, listen, let Jesus determine the future of your life. Let Jesus guide you in who you marry. Let Jesus guide you every moment of every day. Give him complete control. And if you in one moment will yield your entire being with his help to him, making him Lord and king of your life, God will then forever seal and secure your eternal destiny. And you'll never have to worry about death. And so as we talk about death when it comes to saints, listen, I think in our modern day there ought to be a lot more peace when saints talk about death. Listen, God has conquered it. Jesus has defeated death and the sting of it. And so what fear can we have if Jesus has conquered that enemy? I guess our fear is going to ebb and flow with the amount of trust that we have in his promise. I want you to know this morning, it says, if this is the case, if we're saved by faith instead of works, Abraham was. That's why nobody can boast about being a good person before God. This this morning, I want to speak to you. If you don't know much about the gospel, I want to tell you the good news of the gospel is simply this. You can confront these great life questions and be afraid and fearful And look at yourself and see a person who has terribly fallen in sin. And the good news of the gospel is that you don't have to change how good of a person you are or try to become better in order to inherit eternal life. Jesus Christ has lived perfectly for you. 
and he will grant you his righteousness so that you can be saved from death. So I want to ask you a question, and then I'm finished. Here is the unique thing that this church believes in opposition to many other churches, and it is a stark contrast from what other Christian churches believe. Here's what we believe. Many will say, if you want this offer, come up here and accept Jesus' offer into your heart. And so you come and you make all these words, and I I give you the script to say. But you and I know this, that the words you say are not necessarily an indication at the depth of their meaning in your heart. In other words, when I look at my children and I say, apologize, and they scream at their brother and say, I'm sorry, guess what I can surmise about their words? They're really not sorry. It was mere words and formalities that they went through in order to get a certain benefit. And many people today do the very same thing. They think that they can come as a guilty sinner who has deeply offended God and make some passive shallow comments that say, I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Now give me the benefits. Here's what this church believes is distinctly different. No, 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 no. I don't walk you through some I accept Christ formula. There is not some shallow assenting of your brain that you do, but it's with the heart that man believes unto righteousness. You see, what matters is the condition of your heart before God is humbled and surrendered before Him. What does that look like? Has anybody ever came forward and accepted Christ and done that? Absolutely. Absolutely. You don't think that there have been people who have been deep in sin that really them stepping out is a yielding of themselves? Certainly my mother was one sitting on the back row of the church who the moment she yielded to coming forward to seek the Lord is the moment God saved her before she ever got out into the aisle. Because the condition of her heart was one of surrender. Is that a prudent way to direct people to find God? Absolutely not. Because it usually ends in deception. And me saying, I know the condition of your heart. You've truly repented and believed in Christ. No, here's what God wants. Here's what we believe. The moment that you feel conviction of sin. So I'm up here and I'm wailing away about your sin and how horrible of a sinner you are. And you're thinking, I don't think I'm that bad. Man, he's exaggerating a little bit. But there will come a moment where by God's Holy Spirit, he'll reveal to you the wickedness of your heart. Maybe it happens today. Maybe it happens 40 years from now. God reveals to you, no, you're just a terrible sinner. And in that moment, God is showing you guilty before the eyes of your own conscience. So here's what you do. You call out to him. And ask for his forgiveness. Then and there. You don't have to go find a preacher. You don't have to go to a church. You don't have to talk to somebody over and over about how you feel. And let them soothe your conscience. Right then and there. Begin to call out on God. And the moment. That your sinful. Depraved. Wicked heart. Is forgiven. The moment that you are purged of all of those things and in its place is put the righteous life of Jesus Christ, there is something that happens to you. We call it having a salvation experience. I think there was, who was it? I can't remember his name. Yesterday, an actor died, famous actor had a whole lot of problems in his personal life. I began to read somebody, maybe Sister Megan shared some thing. It talked about his come a point where he had to surrender it all to God. And his words were this, I knew I was in the presence of God. That's the significance of what we're talking about. There was an awareness that God does something to you. 
You're not told about it. You tell about it. When once was darkness and then is an illuminating light, do you think somebody needs to tell you about it? Where once was pain and now is euphoria, do you think that you need to be told about it? Where once was sorrow and depression and anxiety and now lies joy that is deep, do you think you need to be told about it? No, salvation is something we experience with God. It is not derived from works of the law. This morning, I'll say this and I'm done. If you thought that you're going to get to heaven through your works, lay those fig leaves down. Lay those fig leaves down. That's what Adam and Eve did when they were caught breaking the law. They put fig leaves together to try to hide their guilt. This morning, I pray that God would reveal to you you need the righteousness of Jesus Christ applied to your heart if you're ever going to make it into heaven. And to receive that, you've got to put your full faith in Him.